This is an early slab for a court for a brass. Um, it's possibly 14th century, and you can just make out the rivets heads for where the metal was once secured. Um, it, it is a very warm condition and it's also been used again as a ledger slab. So they've surf resurfaced the slab, but the rivet heads remain in position because they're much deeper. And you can just see in the top corner some inscription incised, probably a 17th, 18th century um, reuse of the slab as a burial cover. It wasn't really known about until now, so therefore um, I'm now recording it. What was actually the, the, the purpose of brass, the brasses in churches? Well, it was a form of um, memorial which enabled the person commemorated to be illustrated either as a figure or just as a simple inscription. But it was, in fact, the decorative part of a grave colour. The most important part of a memorial is to be buried, pay for your burial, and then to have a slab put over it to mark it. Like any memorial, if you want to show off your credentials and your importance, then if you can expand on the size of a brass, it makes a difference. It's just like the size of the monument. But of course, you have to remember up to the Reformation, it was also a form of glorification of the person it's represented and, his, um, and to the church, because obviously he, this is the importance of a burial site. The other thing, advantage of brasses is, brasses could be fitted quite easily into the floor walked over fine, as far as they were concerned, that didn't matter, it was just the fact that they could be seen and they were placed in the church, in many cases, as near to the east end, in front of the altar as possible. Um, but many of these slabs have all been moved around over the years, so they don't necessarily represent the burial sites, unless you really have hard and fast um, evidence, such as wills, which if you which is being examined more and more nowadays. Original wills survive, and often they say, I request my body to be buried in this part of the church, and so much for a gravestone, and even the price of the brass. And if they say the chancel, and it's in the chancel, then you've got a good idea, it still has never been moved. But in the case of this church, with all the amount of restorations over the 19th and 18th centuries, you cannot, um, justify whether they are, or confirm whether they are in the same position or not. An important one here was the Thomas Pounder brass, which was a Flemish engraved brass produced, um, commissioned by a merchant of Ipswich, Thomas Pounder, and he was active in the 16th century, and he arranged for his brass to be produced in Flanders and imported over with its big black slab, often of Tormene, local marble, to be positioned over his burial slab in St Mary's Key Church. The whole plate was in that position, and it was removed in 1949 for safety after the war, because during the war the church was badly damaged by a bomb blast nearby, and it was open to vandalism, so it was decided to remove all the brasses for safekeeping, and they've ended up now in Ipswich Museums. It's different to the English brasses in the fact that it is a rectangular sheet of metal with the entire surface engraved, whereas the English design up to this period was cut out figures, cut out inscriptions and shields all set in the stone. The colour of the stone polish was the background. In the case of Flemish brasses they used the background as part of the engraving and they had these wonderful engraved details, plates. Um, this is quite um, a latish one because brass engraving from Flanders started in the 14th century. But this is an example of what it was like at the beginning of the 15th century. There's a similar brass down in London which survives to um, Andrew Evengar, who was a merchant who um, in, worked from All Hallows Barking. And he has a similar rectangular plate with he and his wife and family engraved upon it, um, which does survive. Um, we have other examples which have lost brasses of this period, again all to merchants. And Ipswich being one of the Hanseatic League ports, ideally they came in from there. Um, as far as the brass is concerned, its condition, it's got this wonderful 
natural patina to it as a result of it not being walked or worn out or wear, any wear applied to it. It's one sheet of cast metal which is about the maximum you can get because these were all cast plates rather than rolled um, and they were limited to the size they could cope with with the casting process but they have added round the edge um, additional pieces of metal to make the complete plate. Design wise you've got the inscription in English so, and between the figures you have his merchant mark which would have appeared on his goods which he was importing or exporting and the Merchant Adventurers Company arms here and on the other side the arms of Ipswich which necessarily don't bear the correct arms for that period. Um, mistake possibly interpreted by the um, engraver at the time. And you have this wonderful Renaissance border canopy round the actual frame of the figures and kneeling at the feet are the, his daughters and two sons. Um, the inscription around the edge says in English with the four evangelical symbols at the corners. Um, as the brass was produced um, after Thomas died in 1525, which is the, roughly the date given to this brass, um, his wife Emmy didn't die until 1564. And in that time, good many years on, they didn't um, have an engraver who was able to fill in her date of death, which is why it's left blank. Brasses of an alloy is cast um, and poured into a big mould to let to set. And then after that, there's, it is burnished the surface on one side in particular, which is going to be engraved. The other side is left semi-rough because it's not going to be displayed. And then, with the, the, the pattern was worked out, we don't know how, but they probably had templates, none of which survived to this day. And they then put, sketched it out onto the plate and then engraved it using what they call a burin, which is a V-shaped instrument with hammer and this metal um, chisel style object and engraved the plate that way. Um, and then after that, it, obviously, the surface was burnished again to remove any rough edging. And then it was the colouring was applied if wherever that was decided it was going to be put in. Um, so, yes, that's the roughly set process. And then rivets were attached, which were then set into the slab in lead beds. So they, it was lead in, held it in place. And to prevent the metal flexing against the rough stone surface in the slab, it was then um, a layer of pitch was applied, which gave it a certain amount of uh, movable bedding, but at the same time, it also stopped damp creeping through, which attacks the metal from reverse. And often, when we take up brasses um, today, we still find the pitch is still in a semi molten state because it never has properly set, but invariably, it's all gone hard and brittle than breaking up and hasn't no longer served its purpose. So the coats of arms, all this cross hatching here was cut out so that the, except, uh, the covering would be, have something to attach to. So you had gold was um, left as burnished um, br uh, brass, silver was lead inlay um, which there was a few pieces in there for because this is um, nebulae is of a white lead. And then the other colours like blues and reds were just paste put in. Um, very rarely did they actually use proper enamelling because enamelling involved heating the brass to such high levels there was a risk that the uh, plate would be damaged. So they succumbed generally to just putting in a colour material. And um, it's only by careful examination through a microscope you can actually see in the engraved lines any remains. And uh, it's believed that the background tapestry work probably had red in it to make the original brass look even more colourful when it was um, first produced. But being only a paste, um, it quite easily fell out and therefore we never have much evidence of it. Um, we would like to think some of the English brasses are just um, monuments and are just as superior, but um, they obviously at certain periods of the history came up with a far better design than say the contemporary um, in English work. Because you have to remember the Renaissance for instance, 
was far more advanced in time on the continent than it was over here. So this piece of engraving would a design would have been quite a modern advance for its period by the time it came over in the 1520s um, compared with what English art was of the period. So there was certainly a matter of um, one-upmanship amongst the uh, gentry. Look what I've got. I've got something really more advanced, apart from it's not English made, like the rest of you have got. And you only have to go down to St Mary's, the Tower Church, and look at all the brasses there in the chancel floor to mer merchants of the same period. And you can therefore do a complete comparison of what um, they were having from local workshops in Suffolk and Norfolk compared with the Flemish work that comes over from abroad.